Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I realize I'm the one holding you here be between lunch and now, uh, but I want to thank Klaus and Professor Hicks for the invitation to be here. It's an honor to be here. It's not my intention to rain on the PSMA parade, but rather to open the door a little bit um, and make you realize, if you're not aware already, that there are other tracers, other targets in the biology of prostate cancer that I believe are very important. This is an outline of my talk. I'll go briefly over the introduction because parts of it were touched upon by the prior speakers. I'm going to mention some of the clinical use of GRPR, gas-releasing peptide receptor targets, clinically. And then I'm going to share with you at the end our experience at Stanford with such agents. Matthias mentioned earlier the total number of patients. So this is data, estimated data from 2016. And for prostate cancer, it's number one in terms of new diagnosed cancers in the United States. As far as estimated number of deaths for the same year, it's a number two. So a large number of patients continue to die from prostate cancer. So let's look at the rates of dates and what's causing this death in the United States. So you will see that cancer is a very close second to heart disease. And this is data looking over multiple years presented here for 2012 and 13. But this trend stays the same over decades. Now, what happens if you try to apply changes in these death rates? Well, there's been success in heart disease. There's been disease in uh, neurological disease. But look at cancer. The cancer death rates, the changes are dismal, only a 3% change. So close second in terms of new diagnosis, very far distant in terms of what a community of physicians who are doing to actually cure disease. So obviously, there's a lot to be done. And I'm just putting out this um, you know, potpourri of words from the abstract at this conference. And you see that PSMA is one of the most frequently used words. So I acknowledge this. I think that PSMA is a great agent. We use it at Stanford. And I want to thank Klaus and his group for providing us with what we needed to start using PSMA there. But I think that there's um, a need for other agents, because as you heard from other speakers, PSMA is not 100% sensitive or specific. One of the targets that I strongly believe will help us diagnose better and potentially treat patients with prostate cancer is the gastroenolytic peptide receptor, which is shown here. It's a G-protein coupled receptor that's overexpressed in a majority of cancers. But most importantly for this audience, it's overexpressed in many of the prostate cancers. I'm not going to spend too much time because prior speakers illustrated this concept of agonist versus antagonist very well. But despite the fact that a lot of efforts have been put into looking at GRPR agonists early on, I'm only aware of two of these agents that has been translated clinically. One is BZH3, not in prostate cancer. The other one is gallium-68 MBA in a variety of cancers. So I'm not going to discuss this. I'm going to move on and look at the clinical use of antagonists. So what are the agents that have been put in humans to date? If you look at the table on the bottom, the gallium-68 RM2 has been developed by Pyramal Imaging, and that's the one that we use at Stanford. Uh, the group in uh, Rotterdam has used gallium-68 SB3, and I'm going to show you data from their published uh, study. Advanced accelerator applications licensed uh, the product and improvement over SB3 by changing uh, some of the terminal ligand there, gallium-68 neobomb-1. There is a fluorinated version of RM2 that unfortunately didn't work very well, and I'm going to show you that data. And there's also a copper 64 label uh, version of a bombazine agent. I'm going to show you briefly some of that result. So I'll start with gallium 68 RM2, and to date, as far as I know, this is the most extensive data available in prostate cancer. The first study that was done was looking at pharmacokinetics and toxicity in healthy volunteers. This was done by the group in Turku in five healthy uh, men that were imaged. And they concluded that this has suitable biodistribution as well as dosimetry, which is in line with other agents that are FDA approved in the United States. These are data shown from this uh, particular study. And what's striking is that in the second image, when you image a little bit later, there's not much hepatobiliary clearance that would result in clearance in the gut. Therefore, retroperitoneum, it's easier to uh, be evaluated in my opinion, but there's a lot of uptake in the pancreas where a lot of these receptors are overexpressed as well. The next step, and it's the same group from Turku, they looked at patients with prostate cancer, both at initial diagnosis as well as biochemical recurrence, and they were able to identify many of these lesions. 
And this is one such example addressing the presence of lymph nodes in the pelvis. And what's important from their study is that the uptake in the prostate cancer was much higher than what we see in benign prostate hypertrophy, which is one of the dangers of any of the prostate cancer agents. If you have high uptake in BPH, well, your confidence in calling cancer all of a sudden goes a little bit low. This is um, data from a recent phase one, two study, looking at 10 patients with low risk, 10 patients with intermediate risk, 10 patients high risk known prostate cancer. The study was done at Linz and Turku. And when the cancer is present, you can clearly see that it's very visible. There's, there's nothing there fuzzy, nothing there that will make you doubt your diagnosis or what you would call as positive. So the authors from uh, Linz and Turku, uh, which I'm grateful that they shared the data, show that um, this agent is able to accurately detect prostate cancer and significantly higher uptake in prostate cancer compared to BPH, as the preliminary results have shown earlier. They also looked in this study in a selected group of patients at comparison with fluorocholine. And you would ask why fluorocholine and not PSMA. I believe that when the study was designed, PSMA was not already taking the world by storm. So fluorocholine was the agent of choice. And you would see here that in terms of sensitivity, the RM2 has higher sensitivity compared to choline, which again, is pretty important in my opinion. And it was showing, again, the group in Linz, that lymph nodes can be easily identified um, using RM2, including lymph nodes that are not clearly identified with fluorocholine. So this lymph node here, clearly seen with RM2, very faint uptake with fluorocholine. I'm grateful that Wolfgang Weber from Memorial Sloan Kettering uh, shared some of his experience with us. He's using RM2 at initial diagnosis of prostate cancer, and this is a clear example of a small lymph node. So a pokemat, as the prior speaker called it, uh, that's popping right there in the pelvis. In many instances, this is gonna change the surgical plan for these patients, or if it's even more extensive, completely change the management of these patients at initial diagnosis. RM2 can also be labeled with lutetium-177, so can be used as a teranostic agent, and this is preclinical data, indicating success at various doses of lutetium-177 labeled. Um, RM2 in these uh, small animal models. This is data from uh, the group uh, in Santiago de Chile from Positron Pharma working together with Piramal, Dr. Samaral, and Kramer, where they, they are doing actually a comparison of PSMA11 and RM2 in patients with advanced prostate cancer, and they select whether one will get lutetium-labeled PSMA or lutetium-labeled RM2 based on the amount of uptake on the pre-therapy scans. And this is, a, I believe, the first time this image is shown. And again, I thank uh, the authors for allowing me to present it. Um, we received pretty stable distribution in the prostate cancer metastasis of lutetium labeled RM2 up to 168 hours. This is a dose escalating uh, study. So this is after 150 millicurie of lutetium-177 RM2 administration. And what's also pretty interesting is that the uptake in the pancreas that's clearly seen early on washes out rapidly so by 72 hour minimal, and again, same thing continues at 168. So you'd also notice that there's no uptake in salivary glands, so some of the significant side effects that one can um, think about when treating with lutetium-177 PSMA with serostomia and uh, salivary gland being affected by this would not be the case um, with lutetium-177 labeled RM2. This is the agent that I mentioned earlier. Uh, used by the group in Rotterdam, and they used it both in prostate but also in breast cancer patients quite successfully. And you can see in both examples that you can identify the lymph nodes compatible with uh, recurrent prostate cancer. As I said, I believe that uh, this agent was optimized to improve stability, and this is the uh, tracer gallium neobomb one that's uh, currently developed by Advanced Accelerator Applications, and they are using it. Um, they've shown data from the use of this new agent in prostate cancer. Uh, this has a uh, high affinity in binding to gastrin-leasing peptide receptors, um, and the authors were able to identify recurrent prostate cancer lesions in this early report um, published from Germany. This is how it looks like. This is not my choice of colors um, to prevent a comment from Professor uh, Hicks here. Um, you know, one of my colleagues is saying that there's a thousand dollar bill in um, every transverse colon, referring to, their, uh, to our GE, GI colleagues, but 
I'm running a little bit on a tangent here, but you can clearly see the prostate cancer clearly identified with this agent, as well as multiple lymph nodes also clearly identified um, with this agent. So again, uh, very encouraging results um, using Neobomp. The title is Gallium-68 labeled agents, but I want it to be inclusive, and I'm gonna show you the experience from the group in Zurich working also with Pyramal with a fluorinated version of the RM2. Um, unfortunately, this didn't work as well, so the radiochemistry and the label and the um, um, you know, um, structure in space of these agents is very important and how they actually are able to identify disease or not. So this is the primary cancer that um, has been shown uh, to be uh, seen with this fluorinated version. Unfortunately, not all the lesions that were seen with fluorocholine were also seen with the fluorinated version um, of bombesin. So work to be done there, uh, but the gallium-68 versions are working pretty well. And because, you know, dosimetry has been described yesterday in some of the talks as something of importance, and copper-64 has a longer half-life that, according to some of the authors, can make it suitable for dosimetry, there are efforts to also produce copper-64 labeled versions of RM2, and this is um, from the group um, led by Professor Mackey and um, Rosalba Mansi um, that published the first such work in four patients um, with relatively good results. Three of the four known primary cancers have high uptake. One of the four had low uptake, but still above the background, and very nicely correlated with the expression of GRPR um, in this tissue sample. So this will take me to um, our experience at Stanford using gallium-68 RM2, so the pyramal um, imaging agent. The inclusion criteria were quite strict. This is a prospective study done in patients with biochemically recurrent prostate cancer, and we followed the AUA recommendation after radical prostatectomy and the astrophoenix consensus definition for patients post-radiation therapy. Very importantly, in my opinion, this patient had to have negative CT, MRI, and bone scans prior to being um, included in the study. The exclusion criteria were quite straightforward and had to do with their health status and ability to tolerate MRI. So this is a summary of our study. We, to date, included 30 prostate cancer patients prospectively. We've seen one to 60 days after conventional imaging, they underwent gallium-68 RM2 per MR, with a mean administered dose of 3.8 millicuries of RM2. The duration of the exam um, was quite long to um, answer one of the other questions. We aim for 30 minutes for whole body per MR oncology, but we're rarely able to get closer to that. In general, it's 45 to 50 minutes duration of the exam. The uptake time in this study was on average 50 minutes, and these are the MR sequences that we use in MR in per MR and we do use state-of-the-art MR sequences as our colleagues in radiology um, would put for their clinical MR of the prostate. This is our basic whole body MR protocol in PET-MR, so because of the length of the body coil is about twice the size of the axial field of view of PET, during two bed position we can acquire two different MR sequences, so at one uh, bed position we do MR for attenuation correction, EWI, and then a T2 weighted um, sequence. At the next PET bed position, we do the T2 weighted with fat sat. Once all of this is done, we administer contrast and we acquire axial T1 weighted imaging focused on the area of interest. Of course, in the case of prostate, we focus on the pelvis, but for other cancers, for example, we can focus on the liver, etc. The results, we had pathology data in seven of these 30 patients, so we were able to biopsy some of these results or clinical follow-up in the remaining 23 of the 30 patients. PET was positive in 21 of these patients, so 21 of the 30. Remember, all of these had negative conventional imaging prior to inclusion in the study, while MRI was only positive in 10 of the 30 patients. What are the ranges of PSA values in our study? So red means negative PET scan, green means positive PET scan, so you will see here overall, as well as split down in various ranges of PSA. Less than one, it's a small sample, but none of the four with PSA less, less than one were positive on PET. PSA one to two, two out of two were positive by PET. A mixed range here in two to five, and majority of them were positive when the PSA was more than five. Now I'm gonna show you a few examples. This is a patient with a 
medical history of GLISEN 3 plus 4, you will notice that many of these patients have been followed up for years. And that's because in the US we simply don't have access or didn't have access until recently to agents such as PSMA or fluorocholine or others. So uh, this is what explains the long follow-up histories for these patients. This is the projection image. And you can easily identify there's some focal uptake below the bladder. And when you look at the transaxial view images, this is clearly in the prostate bed. This patient underwent 12 uh, core biopsies and only the one that was um, focused and uh, merged with this area of uptake was biopsy proven to be recurrent prostate cancer. And as Matthias alluded to, prostate after radiation therapy, it's a very difficult organ to be evaluated. So PET really adds value in this instance. Another patient, you will see his medical history here. Let's try and play the movie. Anyone see the Pokemats? I really like that word. So. I think they're quite easily seen in the pelvis. And these are tiny lymph nodes. These are two to three millimeter lymph nodes. So I think that right now what we're seeing and what the first speaker mentioned is that we're sort of punting the issue back to oncology and radiation oncology and surgery because now they wonder what do we do with these lymph nodes? Because if you see this, who are we to say that there's no other sites of metastatic disease? There's probably more metastasis that we see on imaging. So do you give a little bit of a radio sensitizer together with radiation therapy? Do you give some chemotherapy? Do you give local therapy, systemic therapy? These are all questions that have to be answered. And fortunately for us, we're part of the team that's working to solve uh, this question. Our entire community of imaging is part of these issues, and I, I believe that now we have tools to help clinicians solve these issues. Another example, this patient actually had a C11 coline scan, uh, and on that scan, uh, this lymph node in the um, external iliac area was called positive. You see faint uptake. Soon after the coline, the patient underwent RM2. If the patient can tolerate an additional um, imaging session, we take them off the table, have them void, bring them back, do an additional pelvic bed here. And this is what we see here. And there are lymph nodes. Interestingly, the lymph node that demonstrated uptake on the coline scan has no uptake on RM2, on bombesin. So that's an interesting biological question to answer. Uh, hopefully this patient will get a, a biopsy and we will be able to answer that question. In this particular case, there was a uh, lung nodule that demonstrated uptake. So is this nonspecific? Is this lung cancer? The patient had follow-up CTs. This nodule grew, and it was biopsied. It was metastatic uh, adenocarcinoma of prostate origin. So quite a surprising finding in this patient with otherwise no sites of metastatic disease. This is uh, one very interesting case. What is that? That's present at the surface of the liver capsule. You can see it here. We don't know what to make of it. The patient underwent a dedicated uh, contrast-enhanced CT, nothing to be biopsied by our colleagues in interventional radiology. Four months later, this thing had grown, and now you can clearly identify a lesion. And this was, again, biopsy proven to be metastatic adenocarcinoma of prostate origin. So, quite uh, interesting location for these lesions. And I believe it's the last case I'm going to show you. Um, we do because we, we think that it's cheaper and um, we don't have access to other tracers. We do uh, combine sodium fluoride and FDG in some of these patients, and this is such a scan where you will notice that there are some inguinal lymph nodes. However, the uptake on RM2, it's more prominent, and this again were biopsy proven to be um, metastatic adenocarcinoma of prostate origin in the inguinal region on the right. So we see a variety of lesions in lymph nodes, uh, lung, liver capsule, bone, etc. So very encouraging preliminary results. Matthias mentioned the issue of scatter correction in gallium, and I think that's present whether you use PET-MR or PET-CT. It has to do with the fact that gallium-68 is a bit of a dirty tracer. So if you look at this MIP image, um, nothing wrong with it, right? How about now? Well, now all of a sudden you have signal missing exactly where you want to look for recurrent prostate cancer, the pelvis and in the retroperitoneum. Well, I'm happy to say that we worked with our uh, physics colleagues at GE, and they have now uh, a software that can correct. So this is after 
applying the software correction, this is now a commercial product, and all of a sudden your, your um, uh, signal is again put back in the image, so now you have something that you can confidently call diagnostic. And this works for RM2, so this is before, this is after. Again, the activity can clearly be seen now with this easy software correction that can be installed on a current device. This also works for PSMA, absent signal exactly in the areas that you're interested in, this uh, signal fills in afterwards. We also did a very small pilot study looking at uh, bombesin RM2 versus PSMA. And again, I want to thank Klaus, everyone in Heidelberg, as well as in Munich, who provided us with um, CMC, as well as dosimetry data that we can apply on IND with in the US, and we we're able to do this study. Um, this is one example, bombesin on the left, PSMA on the right. These are done within two weeks of each other. And probably you can see lymph nodes in the retroperitoneum here as well, but I think that they're way more conspicuous uh, in this case here. So we're looking at different biology. I don't think that one agent fits all. This is another example of uh, where the two agents pretty much um, identify majority of the same lesions, perhaps a few more lymph nodes with RM2, perhaps a few more bone marrow lesions uh, with PSMA, but overall significant overlap in this case. And lastly, in this um, last example from the comparison, there's a supraclavicular lymph node that I can easily argue that it's uh, more conspicuous on PSMA than it is on bombesin. So again, not one single agent is good for everything, but I think that the fact that this is biology indicates that we need more than one agent, and I strongly believe that this class of agents targeting uh, gas-releasing peptide receptors can be used together with PSMA to really individualize how we treat uh, patients with prostate cancer. These are the lymph nodes that I mentioned uh, before. Our paper also has a comparison of uptake in normal uh, various tissues, and this is a graph that illustrates it. Josh kind of stole my thunder um, when he shown the slide yesterday, but I uploaded the slides yesterday, so um, anyway, my slide uh, has the full reference to this paper. And again, it's coming from the US, it's quite painful um, to see how uh, easier it is in another location in the world to actually use new tracers. We have to um, go through a regulatory process for everything in enormously complicated detail. And what's um, really very annoying and painful is the fact that there are regulatory agencies in the US and EU and other parts of the world tend to not talk to each other. So what's acceptable for one agency is not acceptable for the other. Um, with that in mind, um, I want to thank you. Um, and I'll summarize by saying um, we have agents now for the diagnostic and therapy of prostate cancer. This is bringing new blood in our field. And I'm happy to be part of such a striving community. And thank you for having me here. Uh, thank you, Andre, for this nice uh, presentation. Um, you are completely right. We have to look for com complementary other tracers to, to gather more and more information uh, about uh, late-stage disease. So um, maybe... I believe that, might... you know, people are talking about, and even a prior speaker mentioned about the neuroendocrine transformation in prostate cancer and how in that scenario PSMA is not very helpful. There is quite a bit of data demonstrating that gas-releasing peptide receptor agents are actually able to identify disease in that clinical scenario. So, um, and the, the ability to demonstrate the heterogeneity in biology, uh, but also uh, differences in the biodistribution potentially opens a way of, in, in the theranostic area to use uh, this agent potentially in combination with lutetium PSMA uh, to deliver a higher dose uh, to tumour while sharing the dose around uh, other organs. Uh, um, what, what do you perceive will be the regulatory challenges of combining two novel agents in a therapeutic trial? Oh, nothing. Piece of cake. <laughs> um, now, that being said, you bring out a good point. I mean, we all speak about this in, in the US of PSMA, this PSMA, that the clinical trials network actually has a single protocol. So each site who wants to use it will use the same protocol. But there's no patent protection behind it, so I find it difficult for PSMA 11 to actually uh, go through the FDA approval unless the clinical trials network is able to pull the funding while 
the, the, the variants of, of the uh, bombesin agent that I've shown have industry behind it, and hopefully they will, they will see the value of this agent and bring it to market in the U.S. Any further questions? So I'd really like to thank you for staying on time, uh, being respectful for the next speaker, uh, who's you, I think. I believe so. <laughs>